Okay, so welcome once again to Meaning of Mitzvot. Uh, we're looking at number 78, following the majority. Um, as I said, we're here, we're in Parshat Mishpatim, that we're reading the Shabbos, which has uh, a plethora of both positive and mitzvahs and negative prohibitions. This is number 78, <clears throat> the idea of following the majority. I know as always kids were told, you know, don't, don't follow the crowd, be an individual, be a leader, not a, not a follower, be, you know, be the shepherd, not the sheep. But here's an interesting halachic idea, and also a principle that I'd like to sort of develop with you. So it says in the Torah, it says in chapter 23 of Shemos, verse 2, talking here about, um, it's the, the Mishpatim deals a lot with um, the legal framework of Judaism and the, the, the rule of law and the ruling of courts, etc. Torah says, says, Do not be a follower of the, of the majority for evil, and do not respond to a grievance. A grievance is like a dispute um, by yielding to the majority or by yielding to the majority to pervert the law. So it's a very unusual verse here. Firstly, do not be a follower of the majority for evil and do not respond to a grievance by yielding to the majority to pervert. And we can gauge how complex this verse is by looking at Rashi. Always the first place to look is the medieval commentary Rashi. It always offer, tries to offer us the Peshat, the simple, plain understanding of the text. And whenever you see a Rashi, which is the length of this Rashi, you know we're in for problems. You know that Rashi had a lot of issues with this verse that needed to be resolved. Because we'll see that there are two, as it is with everything, there are many ways to look at verses in the Torah. Here there are particularly two approaches of, of understanding this verse. So it says Rashi, you should not follow the, the many, the majority for evil. It says there are halakhic interpretations of this verse, given by the sages of Israel. But the wording of the text does not fit in well with them. So straight off Rashi says, that what the, what the Gemara, that Mishnah and Gemara extrapolate from this verse in order to derive halakha, Jewish law, and seems to be difficult in terms of fitting it with the, with the plain understanding of the text. That's the first thing that Rashi highlights for us. He says, because they derive from here that we must not decide a person's guilt by a preponderance of one judge. So the first thing is, what is it telling us at the beginning? We do not follow the majority, do not be a follower of the majority for the evil. It does not mean to do wrong, it means to condemn someone. When the Sanhedrin, when the, the, the Supreme Court of Israel used to sit in temple times, they had the authority to, to uh, deal with uh, capital offences. Now there, um, you could not just have, according to this verse, the verse is telling us, like let's say it's 23 judges. So let's say you have a 50-50 split, which you technically can't have. That's why it's 23, an odd number. But let's say you had a, 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 a simple majority, meaning you have one more judge than um, um, uh, um, condemning the person, saying they're guilty, than those who are saying he's innocent. The Torah is telling us, that the rabbis derive from this, that a simple majority, a majority of one, is not sufficient. And then it goes on, at the end of the verse, they explain thus, that do not go after the majority to pervert the law, but if the judges who declare the defendant guilty are two more than those who declare him innocent, then decide the matter as they declare, that he is guilty. So a simple majority is no good, but a majority of two or more is good. And that's what it means, and that's how Chazal actually understands this verse, which is, we go after a majority when we are uh, deciding capital cases, but it has to be um, more than a civil majority. It has to be at least a majority of two. The verse they point out speaks of capital cases. The middle passage, they explained as though it was written al rav. The word riv can be also spelt said as the word rav. You shall not speak against the chief of the judges, the rub being the, the, the most senior one or the, the most knowledgeable one, meaning that one should not give an opinion different from that given by the mufla of the court, the most eminent amongst the judges, because this is disrespectful to the presiding judge. 
So again, we have a there seems to be a hierarchy in in the judicial system, as we have in all. You know, there are you know even in English courts there's a, there's a hierarchy. Um, so here the Torah is say, saying you cannot go against the the uh, presiding judge, so to speak. Now, in consequence of this rule, that would seem strange though, because you could ask, well, hold on, what happens if you disagree with them? You know, do you just go along with the, the, the most senior judge? So you know, yes, judge, yes, your honor, just because they're the most senior, you know, is that justice? What happens if you genuinely believe that they have made a mistake or you have a different opinion based on what you see in the evidence? How can it be that the terrorist is trying to stifle um, uncovering the truth? And, and you know, you know, when they're talking about people's lives here, you know, it's not about deferring, right? I defer to you because you've got greater knowledge and seniority. No, it's got to be about pursuit of absolute truth. Therefore, how can that be the case here? How can the terrorist be saying, do not challenge? The the uh, the most senior of the judges. So says the Rashi. Obviously, Rashi's got an issue with this. He says, in consequence of this rule, we begin to take the view of those in the side benches first. We ask the youngest judges to express their opinion first. So 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 that Rashi answers straight away. You're absolutely right. Of course, it would be wrong to to um, tie the hands of the the more junior justices because they're not allowed to. Contradict the most senior ones, and therefore the halakha is the rule is you have to ask them their opinion first, so that they're not afraid to express their opinion. So even if it, it subsequently seems to contradict that which the senior judge says, they've expressed their opinion, it's been heard, and therefore it has to be taken into consideration. Um, because otherwise, so they may not be able to vote against the review expressed by the mufa by the, the most eminent one. Therefore, the exegesis of the verse, according to the words of our rabbis, is as follows. Seem to have lost the rabbi at the moment. Has everyone else lost it? Yes. <clears throat> no, it's gone. We'll see if he comes back. Okay, he says on um, <clears throat> WhatsApp, apologies, my computer has crashed. I hope to rejoin shortly. So he <laughs> should be back. Uh,
It's funny because my computer crashed last week. I had to replace the the keyboard. You know, when I when I use the keyboard, some letters printed and others didn't. So I've had to replace the keyboard. No, I had that on my laptop recently. Just had the uh, underlying membrane replaced. Yeah, repaired rather than had to replace yeah. the whole laptop. Yeah, my son-in-law bought another keyboard and, and fit it is quite it's very good Well, the snow seems to have stopped this side anyway. I'm in the south side, so it's not snowing here either. We just say south side, which is south side? It's the um, sort of a first hill road and all the roads off there and uh, where, the right where side off, of the shops. <coughs> we're off um, Old Deacon's Hill Road, that end. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Stuart, did you see uh, and read Amy's article? You need to unmute, can't hear you. What article was this? His uh, stepdaughter, Amy, is uh, trying to raise funds for writing a children's book. Oh, right. And she had an article about it in, I think it's Woman's Own or something. Woman's yeah. Own. Yeah, was it in Woman's Own, Stuart? I think it was Woman's Own. Um, How did she manage to arrange that? Did she know someone there? I think she, I think she actually... I think she actually contacted someone, yeah, and, uh, and um, yeah, uh, it... All right, the rabbi's back. Bit... No, oh, the rabbi's back. Carry yeah. on later. Yeah. Hi, sorry about that. My computer always decides to crash when it, at the most inopportune times. I think it's having a COVID crisis. Anyway, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay, let's share again. Try again. I think we were middle of the rush -y. Yeah, so I think we said that, so the two things we derive out of this, that, you, that a simple majority in, in, in uh, capital cases is insufficient, and you have to allow the more junior judges to have their say first. Um, then we have, from what, is, from, 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 from what is implied in, you shall not follow a bare majority of evil, I may infer, but you shall follow it for good. Hence, the rabbi said, they said a general rule, in capital cases may be decided by a majority of one for acquittal, but only by a majority of at least two to condemn. So it make a difference. So since it said, since the positive said, since you cannot go after a simple majority to condemn, it means you can go over a simple majority in order to acquit. So it only need a, a simple majority of one for an acquittal. But for, for, for um, a guilty verdict, you need at least two. And then he says, Rashi says, Uncle translates. Now, this is the Aramaic translation and commentary on the Torah. Translates the second phrase by, do not refrain from teaching when you are being asked your opinion in a legal matter. The Hebrew text is to explain according to the title as follows. If you are being asked your opinion in a legal matter, do not give your answer just to incline to one particular side and therefore to, so to withdraw yourself from the dispute. But decide the matter as truth requires. Such are the expositions that have been offered of this verse. You see, 
or she's gone to great lengths to show that, that ultimately this idea of truth, as, Jung, as Unclos is telling us, is that a person shouldn't just try and avoid debate by deciding with one, by saying, you know, I'll go with that opinion or go with that with opinion. No, you have to, you have to, you have to uh, be, be strong enough to express your own opinion, even if it disagrees with others. So that's the first way of looking at Simbi Rashi. I've got a couple of other commentaries which give a more succinct understanding of the verse. This is Forno, again, a medieval Spanish commentary. You shouldn't follow the majority, what to condemn, a tie breaking vote in a trial involving capital punishment, as we saw in Rashi. One cannot declare some guilty of the death penalty on the basis of a solitary judge. A majority of one will be equivalent to a conviction by a single judge. So it's because if you say technically, if that one person has tipped the balance from innocent to guilty, then his guilt, his conviction, is really dependent on that single judge. And that we can't do because it has to be a proper majority. Then the next bit is Glotane al Riv. Um, when your colleagues, the other judges, ask you your, your opinion, Lintos Akari Rabim, so we don't follow, just don't go after the majority, do not be influenced by the fact that the majority thinks differently from you. Assuming that in a trial, 10 of the 23 judges have expressed the view that the accused was innocent, whereas 11 expressed the view that the, the accused was guilty. Lahatos, if you were to cast your vote with the majority, then there would be a majority of two out of a total of 23, 23 voting guilty. And that decision would be would have been arrived at by your single vote. You're not allowed to salvage your conscience by voting the majority unless this represented your absolute conviction. You must explain the reason for your vote. Unless there is a majority of two votes in favor of guilty, no one could be convicted of the death penalty, which we saw before. So I think this bit in the, in the, in the Sporno is very interesting. This idea that don't say, you know what, I, this is too much of a decision for me to make. I don't want the responsibility of having to decide this person's guilt or innocence, and the consequences being, if they're guilty, they could be put to death. And therefore, I'm just going to follow this already majority. I'll just go with the majority. No, we say we don't don't do that. A person has to make their decisions based on their conscience and absolute conviction. And that's a really important lesson we can derive. Not just you know for those not not just in this limited scenario of being a judge, but in all areas of life person must you must present yourself according to your absolute convictions and, and go according to your conscience even if sometimes that means going against what everybody else says and you know we are you know descendants of Abraham Abraham was known as Abraham at Ivri but Ivri will only translate as Hebrew means he was from the he was from the other side of the of the, of the water he went against the tide he was Abraham we know the Midrash tells us he was an iconoclast. You know, all of those surrounding him, including his own father, were idolaters. They worship idols. He was the only one to say, no, this is not right. I've recognized that there is only one God. I cannot, by conscience and conviction, just go along with it. I have to go in the opposite direction. And that really has set the, the, the tone for Jewish people ever since. We are... You know, it was unfortunately, it was Hitler Yamashima who said, you know, the Jews are the conscience of the world. You know, we stand up for what is morally right and true, even if it's to our own expense and detriment, we sometimes have to go against the, you know, we have to go counterculture. That is our calling. And I think it's very much important to see that in here. Uh, says the Torah to me, my another commentary, Akari Rabbi Mahato, is Mikan, the Azinid Bata Ruba. Because here we see that in other things as well, not just in, in, the, in, in the judicial system do we go according to the majority, in all other things as well. Because Dadal Hu of the Torah, it's, it's, it's a great principle of the Torah, Bedinim and Mamanus, Bedinim and Nefashos, both in monetary cases and in capital cases, the Issa Beheta, and also in matters of um, things which are permitted and things which are forbidden. So, for example, in Kashrus, we also have this idea of going after the majority. If you have a majority of one substance, a kosher substance, and into it falls a minority of non-kosher, then we go according to the majority, in simple terms. Obviously, if it imparts flavor that we can't, but if it's completely absorbed and, and, and uh, um, there's no sign of it, then we go according to the majority, 
uh, and we say, okay, similarly with the tomb of a Tahara, similarly with things which are pure, with purity and impurity, we also go according to the majority opinion. The only difference here the Torah is sending us is in relation to capital cases. In all other things, they are achas. In all other things, we only need a simple majority to make the rule. So one more than than fifty percent. The rab b'din in the fashos v'harov notzer the chov at sarach she b'rovze lo pachos mishnayim. As we've seen, uh, Torah Shmuel tells us again. When it comes to uh, um, capital cases, a simple majority is not sufficient. It has to be at least a two. Come avod the rasha the el to deserve the chazal. As we saw, as we see earlier in a in a text on Nami. Okay. Those are the, the, the three uh, um, uh, biblical commentaries on that I wanted to look at. Let's move on more into the realms of halacha and see how this idea develops further. Again, we, get, we turn to the Sefer Achinuch, who goes through all the mitzvahs in the Torah and explains them all. He says, this the commandment of inclining towards the many. To incline, to incline towards the many, uh, and that is when there, there arise a disagreement among the sages in the law of all the Torah laws, and so too in a private case, means to say a case that would have been between, for example, Reuben and Shimon, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Mr. Levy, for example, when they were when there would be a disagreement between the judges of their city, some of them are all guilty, some are all innocent, to always go after the majority, as it says, to incline towards the, the many. In the elucidation, they may they they, they, uh, they may their memory best said the majority is writ is the is by writ of the Torah. Meaning the Torah the, the, the Torah sets out that this is the way we decide disputes. But whether according to the opinion of the listener, they agree to the truth or they do not agree to the truth, logic dictates that we do not swerve from the path of the majority. So here's the same, I can look at that a bit further. He's going to say, you know, having said that a person should, should live by their convictions and their conscience, ultimately, even if sometimes you disagree with things, when it comes to matters of law, you have to go according to the majority. There has to be a system in which we can decide things. He says the reason this is this. It is from the root of the commandment that we commanded do this to strengthen the fulfillment of our religion. As if, as if it were commanded, keep the Torah according to how you are to understand its intended truth. Each and every one in Israel would say, it follows from my opinion that the truth of the matter X is such. So if, you know, it, we know with Jews, two Jews, three opinions, and that's just talking about one person. Yeah, that we that that Jewish people have many, many different opinions. Right now, if the Torah was to be, if we were given the Torah and said, "Look, keep the Torah according to how you understand it," that would mean Mr. Cohen would keep the Torah the way he understands it, Mr. Levi would keep it the way he understands it, and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Everybody would be keeping a completely different Torah. And so even the whole world would say it's opposite. He would not be allowed to do the matter contrary to the truth according to his opinion. If that was if that was allowed, then we could ignore what other people were telling us and say, no, that's the truth for me. What would happen? Destruction would come from this, as the Torah would turn into many Torahs, since everyone would judge according to the poverty of his own opinion. So if we didn't have a way to discern the way forward in things where we're not sure or there's a dispute, everybody would be going according to their own opinions, and you would just have multiple versions of Judaism. Who says we don't have that today? But now that we have explicitly commanded to accept the opinion of the sages about, there is one Torah about it, there is one Torah for all of us, and its performance is great through this. And we may not budge from their opinion, whatever the case. And so, in our doing their commandments, we are executing the commandments of God. God wants us to do it, to do it in this way. And even if the sages sometimes do not reach, come to the truth, God forbid, the sin will be upon them and not upon us. And this is the matter that they, may their memory be best said in the Gemara and Horeus, that if a court erred in a ruling and an individual acted upon their word, they have, the court has a liability for a sacrifice while the individual does, does not, except in the cases that are explained there. Okay, the idea being this, once the Torah has given us a way for deciding disputes, even if an individual doesn't agree with them, you have to go with the majority. And even, and by so doing, you're actually keeping the Torah. Because that's, the Torah, that's the, what the Torah wants us to do. The Torah has told us you've got to follow the majority rule, even if sometimes the majority get it wrong. And even if you know they're wrong, 
we can't ha we can't have the people just going around doing what they think is right otherwise you have multiple forms of judaism and that's not going to work and even if they do get it wrong so be it the responsibility is upon them and not upon us our responsibility is to listen to the sages of our generation and now there's a there's a famous piece of gomorrah and um, which will shoot through but it's really really interesting it's the perfect example of this idea which is you could be a, a, an individual opinion against the majority you could be right you could even be backed up by god himself but we don't listen to you this is the gomorrah it's a famous gomorrah it's known as it's known as the oven of akanai so you learn in the mishnah that if a person was to cut an earthenware oven wet with wide into segments and place sand between each and every segment, or the deems it ritually pure. Because of the sand, its legal status is not of a complete vessel, and therefore it's not susceptible to ritual impurity. This is a technical thing, don't worry too much about it. The rabbis deem it ritually impure as it is functionally a complete oven. So there's a dispute. Rabbi Eleza says it's no longer considered to be something which can become tame impure. The rabbis say, no, it still is considered to be dysfunctional. It's still something that could become impure. So we've got a dispute between the rabbis other rabbis, meaning a group of other rabbis, and Rabbi Eliezer, an individual opinion. Who do we go according to, according to our rule? The rabbis. We go according to the majority. So Rabbi Eliezer has to uh, um, keep shtum. This is what happens in the Gemara. This is known as the oven of Achanai. The Gemara asks, what's the relevance of Achanai? A snake. It's, a, it's an Aramaic word for a snake. In this context, Rabbi Yudas said, the name is Shmuel said, it's characterized in that manner due to the fact that the rabbis surrounded it with their statements like a snake, which often forms a coil when it rests and deemed it impure, meaning it's something you know, a snake can ensnare its prey by, by wrapping itself around it. So this ensnared the rabbis, because this is what happened. The sages thought on that day when they discussed this matter, Aurelius answered all possible answers in the world to support his opinion, but the rabbis did not accept his explanations from him. After failing to convince the rabbis logically, Aurelius said to them, if the halacha is in accordance with my opinion, then the carob tree will prove it. What happened? The carob tree was uprooted to it from its place miraculously. 100 cubits, some say 400 cubits. So a phenomenal thing that happened, a miraculous thing. The rabbi said to him, we do not cite halakhic proof from the carob tree. Meaning, that's not how we decide, that's not how we decide halakhic debates, by a miracle. Okay, Rabbi Lezer said to them, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, then the stream will prove it. The water in the stream turned backwards and began flowing in the opposite direction. They said to him, we do not cite halakhic proof from the stream. Again, miracles are not how we prove halakha. Rabbi Eze said to them, the halakha is in accordance with my opinion. The walls of the study hall will prove it. The walls of the study hall leaned inwards and began to fall. And be sure scolded the walls and said to them, Torah scholars are contending with each other in matters of halakha. What is the matter of your involvement in this dispute? Mora relates, the walls did not fall because of the deference to Rabbi Yeshua. They did not straighten because deference due to Rabbi Eliezer, and they still remain leaning. Rabbi Eliezer said to them, if the they didn't accept it. If the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, heaven itself will prove it. And the divine voice emerged from heaven and said, why are you differing from Rabbi Eliezer if the halakha is in accordance with his opinion in every place that he expresses his an opinion? So God himself is now saying, Rabbi Eliezer is right. You might be the majority, but you're wrong. He is right. What happens? Rabbi Yeshua stood up on his feet and said, it's written in the Torah itself, Loba Shamayim He, it's not in heaven. Mara asks, what's the relevance of this phrase of not in heaven in this context? Rabbi said, since the Torah was already given at Mount Sinai, we do not regard a divine voice. As you already wrote at Sinai in the, in the Torah and our verse, after a majority to incline. So the, once the Torah was being given to us, God has no authority to get involved in halakhic decision making. Because the Torah, so he himself legislated that when you have a dispute of halakha, you go according to the majority. And since the majority of rabbis disagree with Eliezer's opinion, the halakha is not ruled in accordance with his opinion. And there you have it. So even though Rabbi Eliezer was right, even though miracles proved it, even though God himself um, supported him, the rabbis said, we're not listening to you. We have a principle in the Torah. Once the Torah is given to us, God has nothing to do with it. And similarly, it also told us how we discern halakhic uh, um, disputes. We go according to the majority. That's how strong it is. The Gemara's footnote ends off fascinating and says, 
Some years later, Rabbi Natal encountered Eliyahu Anabi, Elijah the prophet, said to him, what did the Holy One, Blessed Be Did He, do at that time when Yeshua issued his declaration? Eliyahu said to him, the Holy One, Blessed Be smiled and said, my children have triumphed over me, my children have triumphed over me. What does that mean? God himself was laughing in heaven and saying, you know what? They're right. They're right. This is the, they are following the system I gave them. I said to them, once the Torah is yours, you have to decide how that is a fate based on the rule of after majority. I can't interfere with it. They're right. They've beaten me. And God laughs ironically because even he can't get, he can't overturn that. It's a fascinating piece of Gemara, which just goes to prove the strength of this idea, which is we have to follow the majority. A couple more sources, and we're running a bit late. A couple more sources I just want to share with you. So, how do we understand this idea? Because this Gemara and this principle, therefore, is very difficult. Rabbi Eliezer was right. He had truth on his side. He did everything to defend truth of his opinion, and yet he was defeated by this seemingly um, unfair rule, which is we go according to the majority no matter what. How do we reconcile that? With what we said previously, which is we should always strive to live by conscience and, and by conviction and always express the truth and find try and find truth. So if you look at the Drash Haran, this is the following. The understanding is as follows. All of the Torah, both the written and the oral, was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. As our sages have stated in the Gemara and Gila, with the Chia Ba Avin said in the name of Yochna, from the verses in the Barim, that upon them according to all the words we infer. The Holy One, blessed be He, showed Moses all of the Torah's deductions and all of the scribes' deductions of what the scribes were destined to originate, namely in the reading of the Megillah. Um, the scribes' deductions and the disputes of differences of opinion of views among the Torah scholars, all of them were taught to Moses, our teacher, may peace be upon him, by the omnipotent, omnipotent one, the provision that decision by be according to the consensus of the sages of the respective generations. Meaning, when God gave Moses the Rabbin the Torah, He showed him that in the future, the sages of each generation would, dis would, would, would debate the Torah, the oral tradition and the, written, and the written Torah, and they would decide it based on the rule put laid down in the Torah, which is we go according to the majority. The Moshe Rabbeinu himself knew what was destined to happen. God himself also knew, obviously. And he showed him. And this underlies the episode of Rabbi Zahagadot, and this is true, what we just saw in the Gemara. Rabbi Shur rose and declared, he's not in heaven. What is the intent of that? It's already been given to Moses on Mount Sinai, as it is written, after the, after the multitude, meaning after the majority we go. Now it was clear to all that Rabbi Ezra was closer to the truth than they. So all of his signs were truthful and righteous, and that heaven itself had ruled him correct, in spite of which they acted according to their consensus. Since their judgment inclined to unclean, though they knew their consensus was out of variance with the truth, they did not wish to pronounce it clean. What is more, had they pronounced it clean, they would have been transgressing against their reason, which is inclined to unclean. The decision having been regulated, relegated to the sages of the generations. So we see that, yes, although we have a sacred duty to pursue truth, we have an even greater duty to follow the rules of Torah that if an individual voice, however powerful that may be and whatever evidence they can bring, even divine support, once we have a principle, that is a principle we have to follow. It's a difficult principle to understand, but there we have it. And I want to find one final source with you. This is from a sefer called the Pele Yoet, which is but it's sort of a quasi-halachic and ethical work, practical halachic and ethical work, um, 19th century. Chapter 15 talks about achdus, about unity. And he says, achdus, unity is a great foundation upon which the world stands. Everything in the world stands and is maintained. And he says, God, gets, God derives great pleasure when he sees the Jewish people are unified. As our sages says in the, in the verse in Eoi, Job, he was, they were, he, he was with him one in one. Echad lo nam it doesn't say one. Ela be echad with one. Why shein a shein a shchina shurev be yisrael ela kashein ba'achdus. 
The divine presence only dwells among the Jewish people when we are unified. The Gedun HaMazer, and greater than this, is a verse in Hoshea that says, Chavo Atzavim Ephraim Hanach God says, Ephraim is he's attached to his idolatry. Believe him be. What does that mean? That even if we, the Jewish people, are idolatrous, which is one of the most uh, serious of, of profanations of God, says the Tanakhuma, if we are unified, then the, then the God's divine justice cannot take effect against us. We are so strengthened by our unity that even if we are idolatry, idolatrous, God cannot exact judgment against us. That explains why God, when God destroyed the world by the flood, he didn't destroy it with the world when they when the, when the people came to build the, the Tower of Babel. Why didn't he just, just destroy them again? Why did, he, why did God disperse them and make their language disparate? Because they were unified. Because the Apostlech says, Because the Torah says, the world was like one voice with one language, although what they were doing was wrong, by trying to reach heaven by being, and, and, and contend with God, since they were unified in it, the, the, the power of God's divine mercy couldn't affect them. So he says here, the final paragraph, The best way to preserve unity is to fulfill that which it says in the Torah, Go according to the majority. And even if it's clear in our eyes that the majority are wrong, and that they should be listening to us because we're saying what is correct. We have to annul our thought, our opinion, according to their opinion. And a proof that that's what you have to do, that you sometimes have to forego your own opinion for others. The verse says in, uh, sorry, as Rabbi Yossi says in the Gemara in Shabbos, he said, I never went against the opinion of my friends. He said, I know, but I, I knew that I was never a Kohen. However, however, my friends have said to him, go up and Dukhun, because you're a Kohen, go up. Even if I know it in my heart of hearts, I know I'm not a Kohen. I would always listen to them. Now that might be a little bit of exaggeration, but the point he's trying to make is this. As he says here, that yes, truth is ultimate, is the most important thing. And we always have to live according to our conscience. We have to express what we think is our correct opinion. And even and in fact, it goes against the tide. However, if that risks unity amongst Jewish people, then we have to forego it. Then we have to go, then, then we have to listen to what the Torah is telling us, which is, you have to go with the majority. Even if they're wrong, even if they know they're wrong, even if they should listen to you, sometimes there's a, there's a, there's a greater, uh, uh, the greater good, Achtus is the greater good. And sometimes you have to just swallow it uh, and accept that, okay, I'm right, but they're not gonna listen to me. And for the sake of unity, I just have to uh, deal with it. Okay, we'll leave it there. Apologies again for the break in the middle. Happy to take uh, any observations or comments on that. Yeah, Rabbi, I'm a little bit uh, confused. Um, the examples you were giving about um, siding with the majority were mostly to do with uh, Rabbonim or sages giving um, opinion in a halachic dispute. Yeah. Um, but does it have bearing on our everyday lives following the majority as a halakhic command? So I think, so you, you're right. So in general terms, it, it's, we're talking about here when it's about deciding halakhic debates. That's the principle. 
But I think we can see from that, particularly from that last source, and we saw, um, I think that was with the Torah what we saw, the, the other idea, that in general in life, the idea that the pursuit of truth is, is very important. And yes, you have, you have to speak up when you think something is wrong. You have a duty to speak up even if you are in the minority. But that has to be balanced with that final thing we said about achdus. And that doesn't have to be in halakhi things. Yeah, even if you, you, you know, you, you say black and other people say white or the other way around, whatever it is, even non halakhi realms, I think that's what we can derive from this. The Torah is telling us that sometimes, even if you're right, you have to go according to the majority. Okay, so what about the scenario where I'm on a jury, the majority have a different opinion from me? Do I simply go with the majority or do I ah, stick so to the majority? So clearly not. No, in that, definitely not. We said you shouldn't, you shouldn't assuage your conscience by saying, well, since the majority must be right, therefore I'll just go with them and I'll, and I'll, and I'll take their, accept their opinion. No, you, you stand up for what you think is right. There's no, there's no achdus there. There's no, there's no concern. These people, you're never, you know, there's, there's 11 other random people, you're never going to see them again. Um, and I don't know if you've ever done jury I remember years ago, I did jury when I was 18. And I remember one case, we had, it was clear, absolutely clear from the evidence um, that the person was guilty based on police evidence they saw what he did but there was someone in that room who had absolutely determined would say no the police always lie not accepting them so we, what could we do what could we do we had to go back into the court and say that 11 of us are of one opinion one person's of another opinion what do you want to do i think i think the judge have actually accepted, he accepted the majority opinion and yeah sometimes they do that yeah um but he was entitled to stand up for his opinion so similarly the other way around you know if, if everyone says X and you believe in your heart of hearts that it's Y, yeah, you say, you say it. I think what we're saying is sometimes you, you, you have a right and a duty to speak the truth, whatever it is. But if if Jewish unity is at risk, then you have to, or even once you've expressed that opinion, if you think it's if it's prudent to do so, you then have to say, well, you know what? I, I can't, you can't force the point because otherwise that's going to impinge on, it's going to impact on uh, a unity. So it's talking about there, there are priorities here. You have to prioritize. What's the most important thing? Always being right. And so for some people, that's, that, for them, that's the most important thing. Always have to be right. Yeah? Um, however, sometimes there's a higher principle, which is peace and unity. And sometimes you have to say, I know I'm right, but I'm going to either keep shtum or I'm going to accept that, uh, that other people just can't see my opinion. It's a difficult one. Challenge. I think it's a life lesson for us there. It does sound to be quite a difficult principle. You've got to take into account specific circumstances. 100%. 100%. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone's going to have to uh, discern it according to the situation and, and what they think is the correct thing to do. But, it, it, you know, the idea is there, the model is there to, for us to decide what, what best thing to do is.